The Tao are one of the few major races that exist within the 41st millennium that make extensive use of other species in their military forces. These are referred to as auxiliaries. However, on the tabletop, we've only seen a small amount of these, the Krut and the Vespids. Technically, we also have the leaks of Votan and the humans, but not as official Tau models. So, in this video, I hope to expand this list by kickbashing my very own custom Xenos race, the Scrav Aok. I began this kit bash by removing some Osiarch Bone Reaper Necropolis Stalkers from their sprue and cleaning them up of any mold lines. My goal with this build was to make a creature that looked to be mycelial in nature. It needs to be organic and flowing so the extruded smooth shapes of the Stalkers were a great place to start. After cleaning up the parts required to build the legs and torso, I was almost ready to assemble them but first I wanted to remove the ragged pieces of fabric hanging from the back. This was done by first clipping away the strips of fabric and then shaving the cut smooth with a knife. I wanted the final model to be separated as much as possible from the original and removing these details will be the first step in achieving that. The Necropolis Stalkers feature ball joints that extend outwards from the torso. The arms I wanted to use in this build already have ball joints, so these would need to be changed to sockets. This was achieved by first clipping away all four of the extended ball joints. Two sockets were created with a rounded tip of my Dremel. However, if you don't have access to a Dremel, then you could drill some roughly 4mm sized holes into the sides instead. The aforementioned arms that I wanted to attach to the Stalker torso were these Tyranid Spine Fist arms from the Termagant kit. These Tyranid components were not only the right scale for the model, but also featured that organic, biomechanical style that I was looking to create with this build. But before I could use them, I first needed to make a few small tweaks and modifications. The first of these were to the ball joints. These protruded just a little too far to work with my new socket joints, so they were first clipped back and then rounded out again using the blade of my knife. It helps to make a few comparisons during this process, just to make sure the arms are fitting nicely into the sockets. I wasn't ready to glue the arms just yet though. The actual spine fist needed to be removed. This model wasn't a Tyranid after all. It would instead be replaced by some similarly sized pulse shotguns from the Fire Warrior kit. This would not only help to distance the arms from the Tyranids, but also to bring the overall model more in line with an auxiliary race that has been armed by the Tau. To join the arms and weapons together, I first clipped away the spine fists, just past where the sort of fingers ended, before cleaning up the cuts with my knife. The pulse shotguns were also clipped in half, with the cuts being made along the middle vertical seam. After being cut and trimmed flat, the front of the shotguns were both glued to the spine fist arms. When it came to the head, I went through a few ideas but ultimately settled on the base of a shield generator drone. I had a few criteria in my search and this part hit all of them. The head needs to be as unhuman as possible while still being recognizable as a head. It needed to incorporate Tau technology and it needed to continue that fungus theme. The only modification needed to allow this piece to be glued to the neck was to clip away and smooth back the small tab. As I decided to omit the usual stalker armor, the chest was looking a little too flat and featureless. So while I still had a termagant sprue handy, I decided to glue one of the extra pieces of chitin to it, but there were still a few more details to add. These details would be sculpted on, which meant that I needed to cut up and mix a batch of green stuff. Once mixed, the putty was rolled into a small ball and pressed into the lower part of the chest. I was originally going to add some holes here, but after adding a few, I felt that some guild-like grooves would be better. These were initially formed using a metal tool, followed by a silicon tool to help smooth out the surface. For both of these steps, I made sure to add a little Vaseline to my tools, just to prevent the putty from sticking to them and peeling it away. This process was repeated on the other side of the chest and a few extra ridges were added to help expand the size of the vents. I did however return to my whole idea and add three of these in a vertical line either side of the armor plate on the chest. After removing the lower arms from the torso, I was left with two empty looking holes. These were covered over with a small ball of green stuff that was flattened into a small disc. 
Then, in order to induce some trypophobia in my viewers, I decided to add a series of small holes across the disc's surface. This not only added a little extra detail to the torso, but also helped to extend the fungus theme. With the torso complete, I could turn my attention back to the arms. The joint between the organic shapes of the arms and hard edges of the shotguns was a little too harsh and needed to be smoothed out. This was done by adding some small rolls along the seam before adding grooves and blending them into individual strands. These were steadily built up until I created the appearance of tendrils that had formed around the weapons in order to hold onto and operate them. Once this was done, I left my green stuff to fully harden overnight. Once everything had cured, I could continue the assembly of the model by first attaching the arms to the torso. A little extra tail flare was then added in the form of a Fire Warrior shoulder pad, which was glued to the left arm along with some helmet aerials to the head. The model was then finished off by gluing it to a base along with a few small chunks of torn up cork floor tile in order to add a little texture. And with that, the warrior of the Scrav Aeoc was ready to be painted. But first, let's hear about the sponsors of this video, The Vagabond's Guide to Dalrida by Penny Dragon. The Vagabond's Guide to Dalrida is a must-have for any tabletop gamer looking to create their own campaigns or add a Celtic-inspired depth and realism to their existing games of D&D. It's filled with detailed maps, fascinating histories, magical items, fearsome monsters, subclasses, spells, deities, NPCs, lore, and much, much more. And yes, there are leprechauns, banshees, bagpipes, and shenanigans. Oh, and whiskey. Lots and lots of whiskey. The Vagabond's Guide to Dalrida is coming to Kickstarter on the 14th of March, and by backing it, you can get yourself a free copy of The Battle of Karagoth, an adventure that pits players against the cunning of Morrigan and the might of her undead army. Plus, if you're quick and back the project within the first 48 hours, you'll secure yourself three luck coins along with the Emerald Heist, Leprechaun's Gold Adventure, all for free. So head on over to the Vagabond's Guide to Del Reader Kickstarter page by following the link down in the comments and description below and pledge your support. Let's make this incredible project a reality. A big thank you to Penny Dragon for sponsoring this video, but now let's get back to the painting. To start the painting off, the model was primed with a black primer, which was applied through my airbrush. This provided that all-important starting coat that would create a unified colour across the model, whilst also allowing the paint to get a better hold onto the surfaces. But before any paint was laid on top, I decided to create some pre-shading by lightly spraying a little Tamiya XF2 over the top of the primer. The airbrush was angled from above so that the white paint built upon the upper surfaces rather than in the deep recesses, which remained as the black primer. This step isn't necessary, but it helps to alleviate some of the problems you face when painting directly over black. It also makes it much easier to get a good solid base coat while still benefiting from the dark, shaded recesses that a black primer offers. My final airbrushing step was to apply a layer of wolf grey from the Tooth in Coats range which all the following paints were taken from too. I applied this via my airbrush, but again, this wasn't necessary. I just wanted to speed up my application. This paint was applied across all the organic parts of the model, leaving the Tautech alone for the time being. If I wasn't using an airbrush, I would have instead tackled this with some slightly watered down paint and applied a couple of thin layers. This would have been slightly translucent in order to allow the previous shading to still show through. Rather than having the model as a single greyish blue colour, I wanted to employ a blend between blue and a contrasting orange. To help out this transition, I first created a mix of rust orange and wolf grey in equal parts, which resulted in a dull orangey brown. This mix was applied across the more prominent points of the raised ridges and protuberances, blending them down into the blue base coat. From here, some rust orange was applied to just the upper parts of the areas I had previously hit with rust orange and the wolf grain mix. However, I covered a slightly smaller area than before which helped to start off that blend between the blue and the orange. The next couple of steps involved highlighting the edges of the orange areas. For the first of these, I focused some fanatic orange to just the edges of the details painted with rust orange. 
This helped to sharpen these details whilst also giving them a brighter tone. Finally, an extreme highlight of orange flare was applied. This is basically just a small dot that was applied to only the corners where two details meet, which helps to give the details a much sharper appearance. With the orange details complete, work could begin on highlighting the blue areas. These were approached in the same way as the orange details. The first paint that I chose was gravestone blue, which was applied across the edges. This just helped to alleviate some of the flatness that the brighter orange had created. To create the extreme highlight, some of the gravestone blue from the previous step was mixed into trooper white to create a slightly lighter version of the blue. Like with the orange flare, this was just added as a small spot to each of the sharpest points. With the main body of the Scrav AOC completed, work could begin on the techy part of the model. I really like the colors of the far side enclaves, so I tried to recreate the scheme. I began with a base coat of Berserker Red and, like before, I added a little water and applied a couple of thin layers to create a smooth surface. This was followed by an edge height of Sanguine Scarlet, which was applied across all of the hard edges. Then, some Demon Red was used to highlight just the edges that sat towards the upper part of the model. This just helped to create the illusion of light hitting the model from above. The red was then finished off with an extreme highlight of Fanatic Orange to just the corners. The only remaining areas, such as the Tau icon, the half spheres on the weapon and the area beneath the dome, would be painted with the extremely dark grey of Death Reaper. By choosing a dark grey rather than a black here, it would allow me to make use of a wash later on, something a pure black wouldn't allow for. Following the base coat, the first highlight was the grey of Dungeon Stone Grey which was followed up with an extreme height of Wizard Grey. The final step in painting this mini was to give it an oil wash, but first I needed to protect the paint that I'd already laid down and give the model a smoother surface. This was done with an all over gloss varnish. Again, I used some Vallejo gloss varnish through an airbrush, but your regular old rattle can would be perfect for this too. This would not only protect the paint, but it also reduces the texture in the surface, which would allow the oil wash to flow more easily across that surface and into the recesses where I wanted it to pool. I created my oil wash by mixing a little black oil paint into some odorless thinners. You can use pre-made oil washes for this, but I find making your own is cheaper and allows you to control the desired tone and intensity. Once mixed, I then applied this over the entirety of the model. The low viscosity of the wash combined with the gloss varnish meant that it pulled into the recesses. But one of the great things you can do with oil washes is adjust them. You just need to dampen a clean brush with some thinners and this can be used to remove the or thin the oil wash. So if it's staining a surface, you can simply clean it up. Once dried, this dark wash would add some really strong shading into those deep recesses of the model. For the basing, I used some texture paste, specifically some playground from AK Interactive. This paste was applied quite heavily across the whole base in order to add a good amount of texture. The result was a sickly green color that gave the base a mossy appearance. However, the result was still a little flat and a little too bright, so whilst the original playground was still wet, I wet blended a little AK Dark Earth into the base as well. This created swirls and blends, which helped to make the base a little more natural in its appearance. After allowing the texture paste to completely dry, I then applied a slightly watered down wash of Orc Flesh Wash. This had a slightly darker green tone than the playground, which helped to add a little variation in the color and helped build up that mossy appearance. After giving the paste plenty of time to completely dry, I then dry brushed some Skeleton Legion across it in order to help pick out that rough texture, before then picking out the edges of the larger rocks using some Vampire Fang. All I was left to do then was to clean up the rims of the base with some Doom Death Black, and give everything a coat of matte varnish to help seal in the paintwork and remove any glossiness left over from the earlier varnish, which left me with this.
And here we have the completed Tau Auxiliary of the Scrav Aeoc. A custom Xenos conversion was a bit of a departure from my normal kit bashes, and to be honest, I found it a much greater challenge than my usual guides. Coming up with something that not only makes sense within the universe, but that is also unique and interesting is far more difficult than a homebrew Space Marine chapter. But even so, I think I've made a half decent first attempt at a custom Xenos race, and if you enjoyed this direction of tutorial and would like to see more, then let me know down in the comments. In terms of gameplay, I mounted this guy onto a battlesuit sized base and built him to be roughly the same size as one, so you could use these as battlesuit proxies. For those of you looking to recreate this miniature and colour scheme, I'll include all the kits and paints used in this guide in the description below, along with some affiliate links to where you can pick them up for yourself. Now, before I go, let me just say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters and channel members who help keep this channel going especially my expert tier and above supporters, who are Jonathan Hart, Maciej Savitsky, Tim, Daniel Dowling, Joachim Folk, Johans, Jonathan Sandsteed, Kasper Limborg, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, Palejuice, Swedsman, and The Googles. And my sergeant level channel members, who are Whale Tussler and Philip Poyer. If you're interested in supporting me, you can hit the join button below or find a link to my Patreon in the description. Supporters get a whole host of benefits, including ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Speaking of merchandise, I also have a few t-shirts and mugs up for sale, featuring designs drawn by me. You can check those out by following the links below or by going over to PeteTheWarGamer.com. So until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.